Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is October 8th, 2015, and my guest is Yuval Harari of Hebrew University and the author of Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind. Yuval, welcome to Econ Talk. Hello, and I'm glad to be here. Your book is about the rise and dominance of our species. It's, um, it's a very ambitious book. It's a very provocative book. And you begin by focusing on our ability to imagine, to create stories and myths. Why is that important, and how does that help explain our history? Well, because humankind controls the world uh, primarily due to our ability to cooperate flexibly in large numbers. If you look at all the huge human achievements, whether it's building the pyramids or reaching the moon, they are never the work of single, a single individual. They are always the work of uh, many people cooperating. And we do that better than any other animal. And no other animal can cooperate so flexibly in such large numbers like human beings. And if you ask yourself what, uh, what enables us to cooperate in large numbers, millions of people, strangers, coming together to work for a common cause, then if you dig deep enough, you always find fiction, mythology, storytelling at the basis of all large-scale human cooperation. Uh, you can never convince a chimpanzee, for example, to give you a banana by promising him that after he dies, he'll go to chimpanzee heaven and there receive lots and lots of bananas for his good deeds. No chimpanzee will ever believe that, which is why chimpanzees don't come together to build a cathedral or to fight on a crusade. Humans are the only animals, as far as we know, that can create and believe in such stories, which is why humans are the only animals that build cathedrals and go on crusades. And this is something you see not only in the religious sphere, but in all other spheres of human activity, also in politics, also in economics. Uh, human rights are also just a fictional story that we have invented, just like the stories about God and heaven. They are not an objective biological reality out there. If you take a human being and look inside, you find all kinds of organs and genes and hormones, but you don't find any rights. It's not a biological reality that humans have rights. It's only in the stories that we've invented that humans have rights. And similarly, say in economics, and money, business corporations, companies, all these things are also based on fictional stories that we've invented. This so, is why the imagination is so important. So uh, I, fic, when you say fiction, I'm a big fan of fiction, and my listeners know I'm a big fan of storytelling. Uh, when you say fictions, uh, a, diff, a, more, a less provocative but perhaps uh, more accurate – word might be abstractions. Is that a fair reaction to your claim? Uh, partly, but it's not always abstract. I mean, God or heaven, for people who believe in them, they are not abstract. They think heaven is a real place above the clouds where you go after you die if you were a good human. And hell is also, it's not abstract. It's a very real place, at least for the people who believe in it. And similarly in even something like, like money, the dollar bill isn't abstract. It's a green piece of paper which has no value in itself. But if you really believe in it, if millions of people believe that this green, of, green piece of paper is valuable, you can go to a complete stranger in a supermarket, giving him this green piece of paper and get in exchange bananas or apples or, or whatever. It's not an abstract uh, uh, concept, but a very concrete reality, which is based, however, on human beliefs, not on physical or biological realities. So just as a footnote to your earlier claim, I, I guess 
Uh, although I think it's generally true that um, no other creature is going to cooperate sufficiently to get to the moon um, or to build a, a structure that's, say, 150 feet high or higher. Uh, ants do cooperate. They are the only, I guess, maybe, the, and bees to some extent. So there is some cooperation in the animal kingdom, but it, but it's dwarfed by our cooperation, certainly. Uh, I think the main difference is that among ants and bees, the cooperation is very rigid. Uh, it's, it's predetermined by their genetic Correct. code. And there is basically just one way in which, for example, a beehive can, can cooperate. Uh, and if there is a new opportunity or danger, the bees cannot reinvent their social system overnight and start something different. They cannot, for example, execute the queen and establish a republic of bees or a communist dictatorship of bees. Yeah. And humans... Or a Disney, or change, Disney World. They're not going to make a Disney, Disney World. world they, bees, they, yeah. yeah. Uh, humans can change their social system extremely quickly from one year to the next without any change in their DNA, simply by changing the stories in which they believe. Like in the French Revolution or the, in the American Revolution, people didn't change their DNA, they just, just changed the stories in which they believed. So uh, that raises two questions. Um, I, it's possible that some stories are better than others or, or have more some reality at their basis than others. Uh, but you begin by asking the question of where this human ability came from, and you have an, you have an interesting idea. Where, where did this, uh, where did the return from storytelling uh, emerge? How did it, how did it become to have value, evolutionary value? Well, we are not sure what uh, what gave Homo sapiens this ability, but with regard to the place and the date, we are quite sure it was in East Africa. Uh, about 60, 70, 80,000 years ago, up until that time, human beings were not very significant animals. You had human beings of different species all over Africa, Europe, and Asia. Uh, but the most important thing to know about all these humans is that they were unimportant animals. They existed for at least 2 million years previously, and their impact on the ecological system, on the world, was not much greater than that of gorillas or, or, or bees or jellyfish. And then about 70,000 years ago in East Africa, we suddenly see humans starting to do very uh, strange things, uh, revolutionary things. They start to cooperate in larger numbers. We see the first appearance of art, of religion, of large-scale politics, and we see the spread of uh, one human species, Homo sapiens, from East Africa all over the world, first to Asia and Europe, and then also to America and Australia. Within a very short time, in evolutionary terms at least, P uh, humans from East Africa managed to cross the ocean and reach Australia about 50,000 years ago, and they managed to cross the Ar Arctic zone through the Bering Straits to Alaska and from there to the rest of the American continent about 15,000 years ago, which are places which no previous human managed to, to settle. And as a result of that, as you point out, uh, they had a rather devastating impact on the, um, the ecosystems that they arrived at. Yeah, d definitely. Or at least, at uh, least we think so. There, there are other theories. You, you mentioned them. There, there are other possibilities. It could be a... Correlation is not causation, but there is some. There's a correlation between human. It appears in the in the rec, fossil record that that the arrival of humans led to um, some uh, uh, large extinctions of large animals. Yes, um, uh, as I said previously, there was no real impact, big impact of humans on the ecosystem. But about fifty thousand years ago, we start to see correlation between the arrival of humans to a new place and mass extinction of large animals in, in that place. First of all, in Australia, where humans arrived, Homo sapiens arrives about 50,000 years ago, and within quite a short time after that, more than 90% of all the big animals of Australia disappear. In America, it's about 70% of all the large creatures of America uh, disappear within about two or 3,000 years 
uh, from the arrival of humans. Uh, 20,000 years ago, America uh, looked much like the Serengeti today in Africa, full of uh, elephants and mammoths and mastodons and lions and horses and camels and many other large creatures that disappear, become extinct within two or 3,000 years from the arrival of, of Homo sapiens. And maybe most uh, uh, interestingly of all, until, about, uh, until the spread of Homo sapiens uh, throughout the world, the world was actually home to many different human species. Just as today you have in the world many different species of bears, you have Arctic bears and grizzly bears and brown bears and black bears. So until, say, 60,000 years ago, you had many different species of humans. You go to different places in the world, you meet different species of humans, like the Neanderthals in Europe. And then when Homo sapiens spreads from East Africa, all the other human species disappear within a very short time. It was probably the uh, most thorough and most important ethnic cleansing campaign in history as Homo sapiens drive to extinction using more or less violence and all the other human species around. It's a little hard to understand both of those parts of the story, the devastation of other human species and the large mega, the megafauna, because we didn't have very advanced tools um, at this point, right? We have fairly primitive tools. We didn't have a shotgun. <laughs> we, didn't, uh, we didn't have a cannon. What do we have? At that point, what do we know, at least? Obviously, we don't know precisely, but what do we think was the nature of human tools for violence at that, at that point? Uh, as far as we know, technology was, more, was just uh, stone tools and, and wood tools and also the use of fire. Uh, but none of these were, were unique to Homo sapiens. Uh, Neanderthals also knew how to use fire and how to prepare and use uh, spears and stone tools. The real advantage of Homo sapiens was uh, in the ability to cooperate in large numbers. Whereas Neanderthals live in small bands, maybe 30, 40, 50 Neanderthals cooperating, Homo sapiens could uh, create networks of cooperation encompassing hundreds, even thousands of individuals. We have evidence from 30, 40,000 years ago of trade between different Homo sapiens bands which we don't see uh, with Neanderthals. We have evidence for uh, political connections. For example, we have tombs, uh, burials of chieftains uh, from 30, 40,000 years ago, uh, in which the, the chief, the big man or big woman, were buried with thousands of uh, artifacts, all kinds of beads and statues and bracelets and things like that, which were probably produced by the combined effort of hundreds, if not thousands, of, uh, of humans. So these networks of cooperation were the big advantage that Homo sapiens had over all the other human species, as well as over the uh, mastodons and mammoths and lions and the rest of the megafauna. So the, the puzzle, though, is that we understand from our own modern experience that cooperation can be uh, it's not really cooperation. Often in, in large scale project, projects, it's coercion. Uh, you have slave right. labor um, that that's used through much of human history to create grand grandiose um, achievements for the leaders. Uh, it, for true cooperation, it's hard to understand how anything large, hundreds, thousands, could be sustained through cooperation because. You know, as an economist, I tend to think, oh, so what's the incentive? Where is the uh, – where's the, what's the glue that gets me to, to go along with this, this grand project, whether it's a war, right? In, a modern, in the modern era, uh, if you don't fight, the government puts you in jail or they shoot you. <laughs> it's very effective uh, as long as, as – long as, as you point out, as long as there's a sustained um, – a belief in the nation state and certain sets of ideologies or, yeah. or as you call them, fictions. But uh, how would you do that in primitive, in primitive times? What, what, would you, what do you think, what can we imagine sustained large-scale cooperation in a world uh, with primitive tools? Well, partly it was uh, uh, utilitarian aims. 
uh, let's say that a Neanderthal band controls a, a good hunting fields, good hunting territory. So several sapiens band come together and expel or kill the Neanderthals in order to take over the territory. And then they have a bigger and better territory in which to hunt and to gather the food. So you certainly have um, uh, material incentives for at least some kinds of cooperation. Uh, the same goes, uh, the same is true of trade. Uh, there are obvious material benefits for the ability to trade between different groups. But then, uh, at least as, as, as far as I'm concerned, the chief uh, issue is again the, the, the issue of uh, telling stories and yeah, convincing yeah, people. Explain that. Explain why, and you make this claim in the book. You say trade may seem a very pragmatic activity, one that needs no fictive basis. Yet the fact is that no animal other than sapiens engages in trade, and all the sapiens trade networks about which we have detailed evidence were based on fictions. So yes. why isn't it sufficient just to say, you have something I can benefit from, let's make a deal? Because the, the problem is you need to trust the other guy. Uh, this is why it's so difficult, for example, for chimpanzees to, to, to trade with one another. Uh, if it was simply a question of, of the material benefits, then why other animals don't trade would have been a very difficult question for biologists. But the thing is, you need if you go, say, in the jungle, and you suddenly see a stranger. So in order to trade with this stranger, you don't know who he is. You don't know whether you can trust him. You don't know whether he's going to cheat you or maybe kill you and, and take whatever you, you want to trade with him. It's very difficult. But if you have some kind of common religion or ideology with that stranger, if there are things both he and you, you both believe in, in, in the same things, then this is... Um, uh, can form the basis for a, a mutually beneficial relationship. And uh, we see this in, for in, in anthropological studies, for example, that when people from two different bands or tribes meet, they often try to look for a common ancestor hmm. or for a common, let's say, protective spirit that uh, even though it's, it's complete fiction, it's complete mythology, once they find such an ancient common ancestor, then it makes them keen, it makes them family, and this gives them the basis to trust each other. Now, it may sound far-fetched when, when, we, when we think about you know, some people in the jungle tens of, of thousands of years ago, but we are doing the same thing today, for example, with money. I go to the supermarket, I meet a stranger, how can I, ten, I, can, how can I trust him? Well, I take out this green piece of paper, which had a mythical ancestor on it. It could be Lincoln or Washington or, or uh, Grant or somebody like that. Well, he's not that and, mythical, okay. probably. He's probably he probably did exist. But go ahead. Well, I, the mythical part, I, I, the ancestor <laughs> part. Go ahead. Yeah, it's it is it, mythical because he's probably not really my great grandfather or your great grandfather. For sure. And he serves <laughs> the same kind of ancestral figure. That uh, that in the case of, of these tribes people was served by probably also in their case there might have been 500 years previously a common ancestor. All people really have common ancestors at least if you go back to Africa 70,000 years ago. But the thing is that you need to find some basic story which you tell children from early age to believe in and, and to trust. And if you find such a story, then even complete strangers can cooperate. Uh, and again, we see it today in our modern economies and modern states with national uh, ideologies or national mythologies, and also with the economic stories that we share. If you think about money again, it's the best example. Modern money has no value in itself, but as long as everybody believes in the same authority, let's say the Federal Reserve in the US, and everybody trusts the stories which are told by the Federal Reserve and by the Treasury and by the President, then this trust enables them to trade effectively. At, 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 the, ba at the most basic level, I think all money is made of trust. It can be, in, in physical terms, money can be gold or silver or paper or even electronic data. 
But at a deeper level, all money is made simply of trust. Well, I want to talk about the book. I want to talk about that. I just want to say first, I'm, I'm not convinced by your trade story. I, I'm not convinced okay. that I'm not convinced that ancient people were able to trade much because I think you're right. I think they had trouble trusting each other. And I don't think ideology or fiction or myths or common ancestors helped them much when they were in the hunter gatherer phase of, of existence. And mm -hmm. probably widespread trade certainly and, and widespread cooperation took a much wider range of not just ideology but also as you point that, out the that's book true. you're money. completely right i mean trade at, at that time trade was small scale and rare and cooperation also it's not that they lived in a common city no maybe once or twice a year they came together for a big hunt or a big yeah. festival and that was it yeah. i mean the, the the cooperation networks were much much more limited than they are today. You're definitely right. Well, let's talk about money because money, I think, is um, – I think a lot of people have a misunderstanding of of where the value of money comes from. I think you have it almost 100 percent correct and I think you have an, an insight that is – that was, is very, very deep about, about money that I want to get to. So okay. it's certainly true – um, it's hard. And, and what's great about your book, there are many things I don't like about your book. I don't agree with. They're speculative. They're interesting, but I don't agree with them. They didn't That's convince good. me, which is fine. But there are many things that make you think. And I, there are a couple that are really special. One is this one that, that we all live with fictions. We all have religions. Uh, it's very hard for each of us to accept that. We all think, well, my religion is the right one, whether it's whether it's an actual religion, so-called actual religion, or whether it's atheism or whether it's liberal democracy, as you point out, or capitalism. We all have human rights. We all have certain things we just sort of accept. We don't – there are many things we question, but deep down, we have a bunch of things we don't like to think about too much and we just sort of accept. And your book makes you ch – challenges those and I'm sure offends a lot of people, but that's okay. It's good to, it's good to be challenged. <laughs> but the money part uh, is, is very deep because most people think, well, there is value to money. There used to be because it used to be backed by gold. And it's no different today. Backed by gold doesn't have any meaning whatsoever. It still was a trust system. What what the the backing by gold did was was make it more probable that you could trust it as long as there wasn't a lot more gold discovered. And so I, I think people don't like paper money. They want real money. There's no such thing. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I definitely agree. I mean, gold, just like paper, I mean, you can do more things with paper than with gold. I mean, today in electronics, maybe you can do some things with gold. But for most of history, gold was a completely valueless metal. The only things you could make from gold were artifacts with cultural value, like jewelry or, or statues or crowns. You couldn't make a sword or a plowshare out of gold, it was, it's, a, it's a very soft metal. It's not good for it's making useless. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah. the, the yeah. only value is, again, that people trust it. But that's and they the trust it because the king and the priest say we should trust it. You see the king, and he has a gold crown, so you develop this kind of special, uh, oh, special liking to gold, but really it has no value. It's just well, like paper. The deep part that I love that you point out is that a lot of people say what you just said, and they say, well, gold has some value because it could be used for jewelry. But the truth is, it's the opposite. The causation probably goes the opposite direction. The reason we like gold jewelry is because it's money. <laughs> because, it, I mean, that's a very deep point. I think you're right. Uh, I never thought about it. I think the idea that uh, what we want to show off with happens to be gold isn't because gold is inherently beautiful. We do think it's beautiful now, but that's only because we've come to think of it as valuable. But it's, it's like you said, it's just a soft yellow metal. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you look today, I mean, most of the money today in the world is just electronic data. Yeah. I mean, if you take all the real dollar bills, the paper and, and the, the nickels and all that, it's less than 10% of the dollars that are uh, only on computers. But the only part I want to push back on, the part I, I think there's a little more to the story, which is it, trust. I'm, again, I'm not sure it's I, it, it's part of it is trust, but part of it is, uh, I would say a little bit differently, maybe expectation. So I'm willing to accept a dollar if I expect that other people will take it. 
that yes. trust can disappear if the if the sovereign inflates the currency and makes it its value fall steadily, which has happened many times in human history by both kings and and democracies and other forms of government. I stop trusting it. It's not yes. it's not a pure myth in the sense that it's it's something I want I'd like to believe it, but if once I see that it doesn't work, I drop it very quickly. So the trust is somewhat fragile. The other point I think to make is that at the national level, it's not just that the king's crown is gold, it's that the king takes his taxes in gold. Mm -hmm. And once I can once I I know that I can pay my obligations to the sovereign, whether it's the government or the king, uh, whether it's a democracy or a king in, say, dollars, then I'm very – I'm much more confident and realistically so that I can – it'll be accepted more widely. So it's not – it's not pure trust. It's not just bl- – I'd say it a different way. It's not blind trust. No, definitely. When I say trust, I don't mean blind trust. Trust is something that you need to work very hard in order to build. I mean, people are obviously, they are not fools. You can't just go and say, okay, this is now valuable and everybody would believe you. You need to do a lot of things, whether it's ceremonies or whether it involves coercion. For instance, you see that um, in modern empires, when the Europeans reach Africa and they want to convince the, the local population to start using money, to start using paper money that the, that the imperial empires print, what they do is they demand that the local population pay taxes with money. And then the local people, they need these pieces of paper because this is the only way they can pay their taxes. And if they don't pay their taxes, then trouble. the rulers <laughs> use violence. Yeah. So yeah. This, this creates the initial uh, trust in a way. Or, or the initial need for these valueless pieces of paper, you must have them in order to pay your taxes. And this is how they start building the trust or the need for these uh, pieces of paper. So I want to go back to the timeline. And I want to, uh, we were, were talking about primitive human beings. I want to fast forward about 50,000 years and get to the agricultural revolution. Um, and you argue that agriculture was really not a very attractive tr- transition. It was, uh, you call it a trap. Why was yeah. agriculture a trap? What's wrong with it? Well, um, for the human collective, it was obviously a, a huge step forward because without agriculture, you couldn't have cities and kingdoms and empires and so forth. But if you look at it from the viewpoint of the individual, and not the king or the high priest, but the ordinary peasant, then you find that in most agricultural societies, especially early agricultural societies, the life of the average individual was actually much harder than the life of hunter-gatherers previously. First of all, on the most basic level, our bodies and our minds evolved for hundreds of thousands of years in adaptation to living as hunter-gatherers, to go to the wood and look for mushrooms and climb trees and run run after rabbits and things like that. But then most peasants, what they do all day are very different things. They have to work in uh, all kinds of jobs, like plowing the field or grinding the corn or bringing water from the river, jobs that are much more difficult for the body and much more boring uh, uh, to the mind. In exchange for all this hard work, peasants usually got a worse diet. Hunter-gatherers subsisted by eating dozens of different species of plants and animals and mushrooms and fish and whatever. Peasants, in contrast, say in ancient China, they ate rice and rice and rice. It was a much more monotonous diet, uh, much poorer in vitamins and minerals and so forth. In addition, peasants suffered far more from infectious diseases because most infectious diseases came from domesticated animals and spread in the unhealthy, unhygienic conditions of early villages and towns. Hunter-gatherers suffered far less from infectious diseases. And one last important point is that whereas hunter-gatherer societies were relatively egalitarian, there were no huge differences between rich and poor, 
with the arrival of agriculture, you also see the rise of steep social hierarchies, of exploitation, of small elites, of kings and priests and bureaucrats exploiting the masses of the population. So for the collective and for the elites, agriculture was a very good thing, but for the average peasant in ancient Egypt or medieval Europe, agriculture was a much less a, a bra- much less a, a positive development. And then you also argue, because you have to if you're going to push that argument, you also argue that you, you need an answer to the question of why people then didn't just leave the farms to go back to hunter-gathering if it was so miserable. And you, you, you give an answer to that. Yeah, there are several answers. First of all, uh, you had many more people. Agriculture supported demographic growth. Uh, you had many more people living on the same territory. Each person perhaps lived a harder life, but you had many more of them. And you simply couldn't go back without most of the population dying from hunger, which and nobody would volunteer to die of hunger to, in order to go back. Uh, secondly, you have the coercive power of the elites, which now control society and wouldn't let it happen. And finally, with the transition to agriculture, most of the skills that people needed in order to live as hunter-gatherers uh, were disappeared. So it's, 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 not, it's not like you, you're a peasant or you, you're a, a worker and you can simply go to the forest and start living as a hunter-gatherer. You probably die very quickly. If I today, for example, try to leave my job as a university teacher and go to live as a hunter-gatherer, I would be dead within a week or two. So the part I disagree with, and I think there's some obvious uncertainty about this, but the part I really like is this idea that we went from an unhierarchical, relatively unhierarchical, I think, I've got to be careful here because we don't really have great evidence on what undergatherer hierarchy was like. Uh, and I'm going to push, I've got some information on that that I want to mention in a second. But the, it seems to me, so that part I agree with, that, that certainly when we went from smaller groups to larger groups, the ability of, of the elites to control larger groups of people through force uh, is is an important change in human well-being that it's taken a long time to make some progress against. And I, I would argue we have made progress. I'm not sure you agree. Well, I'll talk about that next. But the point I want to emphasize is that hunter-gatherers had a t- very tough life. Now, you suggest that they don't, they don't work very hard and they have a lot of time for leisure. I think that's a very uncertain proposition. There's a lot of evidence that to sustain enough protein to keep a human being alive takes a lot of time. And many of the studies of, of hunter-gatherers existence or at least primitive people that are still around require a huge amount of work. Uh, it's a lot of berries. It's a lot of berries to keep a person going. So um, do you want to hedge that at all? Yeah, I mean, I think the main point is not to say that Hunter Gatherer had an ideal existence. This is not the point at all. The point is that peasants had an even harder existence. The, 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 main, the main issue is what is the situation of the peasants? not what is the situation of the hunter-gatherers. I think there are some romantic views about hunter-gatherers uh, de- depicting their life as ideal, as living in paradise, and this is obviously uh, far-fetched. Life as a hunter-gatherer could be very hard, but life as a peasant in ancient China was even harder. That's the main point. Yeah, I'm not, I don't know, but it, I agree. I'll take the point that it, they're both pretty hard. Um, so, so that's... Uh... It raises the question that I that I alluded to a second ago, which is this question of progress. You're not much of an optimist. Um, you don't see much of a. I, if I hope I'm being fair to you, you in the book, you don't see human uh, well-being improving over time in any fundamental sense. Is that a fair summary of what you believe, or is that unfair? No, it's fair. I think humans have an amazing capacity to acquire power but they are not good at all in translating power into happiness and into well-being. At least until then, I think the early 19th century, you don't see any correlation between power and well-being. If you use all kinds of objective measurements, like life expectancy, child mortality, and things like that, you don't see any correlation between power and well-being. Over the last 200 years, For the first time in history, we start seeing some correlation. 
But again, the trend is not just one dimensional. Uh, there are also some very uh, problematic things happening over these last 200 years, which makes it difficult to argue that we finally solved the, the, the problem and that now we have a very clear and direct correlation and that every increase in power necessarily makes humans uh, better off than before. Yeah, it, it, the, I guess the other way to think about it is we don't know whether the last 200 years or so are an anomaly or not, but um, my cherished, cherished fictions, I have many, um, <laughs> it, give me hope, but I'm probably just fooling myself. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a, a short um, quote here that uh, lets you uh, riff on and talk about because – uh, again, you, so you can annoy some of our listeners. And <laughs> take, <laughs> what you say, for example, here's what you say. You say, for instance, the most cherished des desires of present day Westerners are shaped by romantic, nationalist, capitalist, and humanist myths that have been around for centuries. Friends giving advice often tell each other, follow your heart. But the heart is a double agent that usually takes its instructions from the dominant myths of the day. And the very recommendation to follow your heart was implanted in our minds by a combination of 19th century romantic myths and 20th century consumerist myths. You want to talk about that? Uh, yeah, I, I'll be happy to. Uh, if you, if you, many of the things that people today consider as uh, necessities were until a very short time ago luxuries that we could easily live without. And many of the things that people really desire, like going on vacation abroad, there is nothing natural about wanting to go on vacation abroad. I mean, most people in history didn't think about it. Uh, chimpanzees are cousins. You don't see any alpha chimpanzee male using his power and authority in order to go on vacation to the territory of the neighboring uh, uh, chimpanzee band. I mean, basically... Uh, you don't have within yourself a box with all kinds of special emotions and sensations. And on the box, you have a, a, a big warning, open only when you're in Paris. And unless you get to Paris, you'll never experience these sensations and emotions. Doesn't, doesn't work like that. Basically, anything you can experience in life, you can experience wherever you are at the present moment. So there is nothing, as I said, natural or obvious about wanting to travel to the other side of the world. But but you suggest that travel is like a a a, a, a trick that I'm tricky. I've been tricked into wanting to travel because yes. of. So how do you how do you make that argument? Explain that so to me. You see again and again on television, in movies, you get a lot of messages that you need to travel that travel is important, it will be good for you, you'll be happy, unless you travel, you won't be happy. And when you hear it so many times from early age, you become convinced that this is true. And let's say that, I don't know, a, a married couple have a, a, a crisis in their relationship. <laughs> so the husband or wife would suggest, okay, let's, let, let's forget a minute about all these problems and go to Paris. This will solve our problem. Why? Because I saw so many commercials and so many films in which a problem in a relationship was solved by traveling to Paris that I believe in it. So I'm going to turn it around. I, I, that's stupid. I, I certainly agree. And, I, and, and previous econ talk guest uh, Alain de Baton makes the great point that uh, when you travel, you, you escape much of your environment. But the one part that you can't escape is you. Uh, yourself, when you, when yeah. you're in Paris, you're you're with yourself. That might be the best travel if you could leave yourself behind, but that's not an an option, at least in present day uh, <laughs> technology, right? So let me let me flip it around. So uh, i i was in uh, I was in Jerusalem last April, okay, and and I had a glorious trip. I saw things. In fact, I was in the Israel Museum in in Jerusalem, which has many of the. The, some of the artifacts you mentioned earlier, and it was exhilarating to see it. I was in London last fall, and we're going to talk about empire in a minute. I wanted, and I'm in the British Museum, and I saw some extraordinary things that I, I, I had only read about that were amazing, like the Rosetta Stone, the um, the uh, Elgin Marbles, the Cyrus's Cylinder. I mean, it's fabulous. What, was I just a, a pawn of consumer? 
uh, myths that I would go and have a good time? Did I really not have a good time? <laughs> no, I don't, I don't want to take it to the other extreme and say to you that travel is bad and that uh, you actually have bad experiences while you're traveling. Travel can certainly be a, a very inspiring and, and, and very, pl- very pleasant experience. What I'm saying with the deep uh, consumerist myth is that you must have it. You cannot really be happy and content unless you travel. This is, this is the issue that people confuse what is basically an unnecessary luxury with a kind of basic need. And this is something that develops with time. You see a trajectory throughout history that luxuries tend to become necessities with the passing of time, and people become convinced that they cannot live without them. Um, and this is especially problematic today because if you think about the standard of living of the common American, uh, if every Chinese and every Indian and every African had the same standard of living as the average American today, the global ecology would collapse. There is no way, at least under present technological capacities, there is no way that planet Earth can provide all the Chinese and Indians with the same standard of living as Americans. So if all these things like big houses and SUVs and vacations abroad and so forth, if they are really necessary for humans to be happy, then we are facing a very, very stark choice between keeping billions of Chinese and Indians unhappy and destroying the planet. Yeah, I don't think that's the. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave that alone. I, it's an interesting point. I don't. I take. You know, it's as you said. We don't have it, at current levels. It would be difficult to imagine. Of course, it's difficult to achieve. But of course, in 1800 or 1850, and even 1900, if you said there's going to be seven billion people, and even fewer of them are going to be in poverty than uh, than now, or certainly as a percentage, and after a while, in absolute numbers. Um, it would be impossible. But of course, as you point out many times in the book, we're a very imaginative species and we come up with some very some very good things. But I want I want to move on. I want to talk oh, about uh, empire and science, which you have some very interesting observations about. Let's start with uh, two myths that you uh, uh, disagree with, two arguments about empires that you think are wrong. One, and this I'm quoting you, empires do not, I'm quoting you as the, Listing the myths, you don't agree with this. One, empires do not work. In the long run, it is not possible to rule effectively over a large number of conquered people. Peoples, too, even if it can be done, it should not be done because empires are evil engines of destruction and exploitation. Every people has a right to self-determination and should never be subject to the rule of another. And you push back against both of those views, which is very um, contrarian and very interesting. So uh, talk about why you think those two commonly held views are not correct. Well, the first view that em- empires don't work, it's simply wrong when you look at the facts. For the last at least 2,000 years, empire has been the most successful political system in, in the world. Most people for the last 2,000 years lived in empires, and most empires did not collapse because the subject of people revolted. As some of them lasted for centuries. And when they eventually collapsed, it was often because either of external invasion or because the elite itself uh, fell out and started uh, to have internal conflicts. So it's not true that empires don't work. As for the moral value of empires, this is, of course, a much more delicate and complicated issue. Uh, We don't have much time, so I will only point out that most of contemporary culture is an imperial legacy. So if empires are evil, it means that most human culture today in the world is evil or the product of evil. To give just one obvious example, most people today on the planet talk and uh, think and dream in imperial languages, languages which were created and spread sometimes with violence, by empire, whether it's English, French, and Spanish, or Arabic, Turkish, Russian, and Chinese, Han Chinese, these are all imperial languages. Similarly, if you think about religion, most of the religions in the world were spread by uh, by empires. 
So you, you see like Christianity spread first by the Roman Empire so you, uh, and later by, uh, uh, say, the Spanish and Portuguese, the French. So you have people throwing off at, at a certain point the yoke of the empire, the political yoke, but they go on believing in the religion of the empire and they go on using the language of the empire and you can say much the same thing about cuisine, architecture, uh, legal concepts and so forth. The part I found particularly interesting is your observations and details about how science and uh, let me say it a little bit better and I'll let you say it better. The modern willingness to admit ignorance was an enormous scientific breakthrough. Explain that and then explain how that combined with empire and science. Oh, OK. I'll, I'll try. I know it's a tough one, but, it, but it's, it's well said in the book. Hard to do on your own on one foot, but take a shot. I'll try. Um, most pre-modern cultures were convinced that they have the answers to all the important questions. Like if you think about medieval Christianity, so the Christians in Europe, they believed that the answers to all the important questions of life are in the Bible or in the writings of the church fathers. So if you start with the idea that we already have all the answers, this obviously uh, doesn't uh, give you much of an incentive to look for new knowledge, because what's the point? We already have all the, all the answers, all the important knowledge. Maybe we can discover something new, but if it's not in the Bible, then by definition, it's not important. If it was important, God would have tell, told us this piece of information in the Bible. Then you have the scientific revolution. And the most important discovery of the scientific revolution was the discovery of ignorance, of the fact that there are many important questions which we don't know the answer to. The answers are not in the Bible, they are not in the, in the Quran, they are not in the Confucian analects, nowhere. We simply, nobody knows the answers to these questions. And this gives you the incentive to start looking for new knowledge and the idea is, if we find new knowledge, maybe we can solve problems which at present seem to be impossible. And what we see over the last few centuries is that indeed the discovery of completely new knowledge enabled humans to solve all kinds of problems which were previously thought to be insoluble, impossible to solve. Uh, for centuries, people believed, for example, that uh, uh, plagues, were just a part of the natural order of things. Maybe if God wants, there won't be any plagues, but this, this is up to God. There is no way that humans can find the solution to uh, all the plagues by themselves. But over the last century or two, science has managed to overcome most of the most uh, uh, lethal in, uh, infectious diseases that humankind faced, so that today, more people, for the first time in history, more people die from old age diseases than from infectious diseases. And the same is true of famine. For centuries, millennia, people thought that famine is just an, an, a part of the world. Only when the Messiah comes, there won't be famine. But today, more people die from eating too much than from eating too little. Humankind has managed to overcome famine not by divine assistance, but by discovering new knowledge. And talk about the way that um, science and empire, oh, uh, the, yeah. the, explora the discoveries of science were tied in to the discoveries of empire. Yeah, we tend to, th to think that science is good and empire is bad. But for most of, of the last 500 years, science and empire were two sides of the same coin. Uh, the European empires could not have spread and conquered the world without the uh, help of modern science and vice versa. Modern science was developed to a large extent thanks to the efforts and the investment of the European empires. Not only in, in you have obvious cases like geography, uh, which was developed mainly thanks to the contribution of, uh, of the empires. But also, even if you think about Charles Darwin, people often don't uh, remember or don't think about it. 
But uh, Darwin, when he went to on the Beagle, the ship Beagle, around South America to the Galapagos Islands, and the uh, evidence, the facts the, that he witnessed uh, caused him to start formulating the ideas that eventually became the theory of evolution. This voyage was not a scientific expedition. It was a military expedition. It was a ship of the British Navy, of the Royal Navy, sent to map the coasts of South America in preparation for war. And the captain took Darwin along on, on this expedition. And you see it happening again and again, this combination of science and empire. Basically, they share the same, uh, the same desire, the same mindset, which we can, we can call the mindset of exploring and conquering, the idea that there is something out there beyond the horizon, and we should explore it and conquer it. And conquering both in the military sense, but also in the scientific sense, that we study things, not just in order to know, but in order to control them, to manipulate them. So he, this is the, the deep connection between science and empire over the last 500 years. And I also would argue, and you don't, you don't say this in the book, but I would also argue that and I want to defend religion here for a minute and, and the divine. Uh, science has its own religion, which, of course, is that things are discoverable. And they hmm. are. And they are. And that's a remarkable thing. We just sort of take it for granted. We just sort of assume uh, that that's the way the world is. But it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, and that is really um, – why that is is an unanswerable question, uh, but it's a remarkable thing that allows us to extend our control that it wouldn't have to be that way, but it, but it evidently is. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. And of course, there could be some things which are undiscoverable, but for obvious reasons, we haven't discovered them. <laughs> well, we know, we know some things are undiscoverable, right? It, it, it's, it, it's, it's a... The paradox that science has um, informed us about what we don't know. You know, the mm -hmm. first min minute, minuscule, nano, nano, nano second of the of the Big Bang mm -hmm. is veiled from human knowledge, uh, at least as far as we know. That's at least the belief of science right now. I don't. I guess it could change. It could change, but I don't think. could change. When you have many examples from the last five hundred years of uh, all kinds of questions which people thought we'll never find the answer Correct. to that one. Correct. And then within 100 or 200 years, we, we've got the answer. Yeah, someone was telling me yesterday how bad voice recognition is. We'll fix that, but the, that's, <laughs> that's an easy one. Uh, yeah. The real, uh, perhaps the world can be divided into those who think that everything will be discovered and we will master everything uh, versus those, and I would put myself in this latter camp, those who argue that, there are certain mysteries that we will not uh, we will not ever uncover, um, and uh, so I, I'm going to just talk about the British Museum for a second. When I was in the, I mentioned it earlier, I was in the British Museum, and I I couldn't help but be struck by the fact of how much human knowledge and how much stuff had been accumulated through plunder <laughs> and theft yes. and and um, and misguided self righteousness, oh, as you point out many times in the book. Uh, and I, I was reminded of the scene in the in the movie Life of Brian, where the the their com people are complaining about the Romans. Oh, what have the Romans ever done? Well, they gave us the roads. You know, other than that, well, they gave us you know <laughs> water and and uh, aqueducts. Yeah, but other than that, well, the schools. So it's an amazing thing. We don't like to think about it, but of course, many aspects of civilization that we call civilization came from empire and. In many ways, to me, the British Museum is the church of that religion. It's, it, is, it is awe-inspiring to see what human beings were able to achieve and collect, through even often through not-so-attractive ways. But it's amazing it's there. And the British had an unimaginable curiosity that you chronicle in the book. They, anytime they went somewhere, they tried to figure out what was going on for selfish reasons often. But sometimes it was a mix, right? Yeah, definitely. It's not uh, as I said. I mean, the, the view of empire as, as all evil is very problematic because this implies that uh, most of uh, modern culture and most of science is evil. Yeah, which is that's hard to that's hard for our religious our myths our fictions. That's not we don't like that idea. Um, 
Let's talk about capitalism. Uh, it's, this show is called Econ Talk, after all. Um, you, you're critical of Adam Smith. I think a little unfair. Well, I think unfairly. Uh, but talk about your view of capitalism and, and its mythologies. Well, I think the basic uh, story of capitalism, which might be true, I'm not saying it's, it's false, but uh, it's just the basic story of capitalism, is that economic growth is the most important thing in the world. And anything worth having, you must have economic growth in order to have it. It doesn't matter if you want democracy or human rights or equality or uh, anything. You, f you have to have economic growth. Uh, in order to in order to get it, and on the individual level, this is tied with uh, the story which says that if you have any problem in your life, you must buy something. The solution is probably to buy something to consume more stuff, and in order to buy more things, we need to produce more things, which brings us back to economic growth. So I would define uh, capitalism as the religion or, or ideology which thinks that uh, economic growth is the most important thing in the world because it's the key to everything else. Whether it's happiness or justice or freedom, you can't have any of those unless you have economic growth. So how did that idea come to be? Uh, I, I think you're onto something. I don't, uh, I don't see it quite as, as bleakly as you do in various parts of the book, but how, how did that idea become our, our religion? to the extent that it is? Well, um, first of all, it, uh, we have to emphasize that it's, it's a very, to us, it seems quite natural because we live in a capitalist world, but it's, it, it, most people in history couldn't grasp such, a, such an idea because growth is, in a way, um, stands in contrast to the basic experience of the world and to, the, to our evolutionary legacy. Uh, most of existence uh, is zero-sum games in which uh, your profits are my loss and vice versa. And for most of history, people thought that the only way for one person to become richer is for another person to become poorer. The only way for one kingdom to be more prosperous is for another kingdom uh, uh, to become uh, more miserable. But then came along uh, Adam Smith and, and others, of course. And I think that the, 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 their idea here uh, was not just an economic revolution, but also an ethical and religious revolution. They had the uh, uh, notion that everybody can profit at the same time because the entire, if the world is a pie, the entire pie can grow simultaneously. I can have a bigger slice of the pie, not by taking something from you, but simply by making the pie larger so that everybody will have more at the same time. Uh, this was an amazing insight, which at least until today has proved itself. I mean, the world has been growing, the, the economy has been growing. Uh, maybe uh, not everybody benefited, certainly not the other animals, but if you look only at humans, then this idea that everybody can have more at the same time so far has proven itself to be correct. But it's a very, very difficult idea to grasp and to convince people to believe, which is why even today uh, there are many people who don't accept it and don't understand it. Don't you think we have, um, a, I hate to say it, a biological urge for more? Yeah, all, all animals have a biological urge for more. Um, this is not something which is uh, strictly unique uh, to Homo sapiens. For most of history, societies um, were built on the assumption that, yes, individuals always want more, and we have to discipline individuals. We have to make them resist this temptation because the only way to create social harmony is for people to settle for what they've already got and not want more. The revolutionary idea of capitalism is that no, uh, we not only don't have to discipline people and to make people settle for what they have, it's just the opposite. We have to encourage people 
to want more and more all the time, because this is the driving force behind economic growth. The greatest threat to the economic system is if people settle for what they've already got and not want more than they have. If this happens, then growth, growth stops and the entire capitalist system will collapse because it can't go on unless the economy keeps growing indefinitely. No, I, don't, I don't know if that's true. I don't think we need to keep growing. I think we could certainly have a healthy economy. It's where our religions don't always work well together, right? We have one set of religions that says, the consumerist religion that says, if you have more, you'll be happy. You want this new gadget, et cetera. And we have this other more traditional religion that often says, be happy with what you have. Uh, Adam Smith wrote a book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, that basically said it, wanting more is a mistake. You're not going to be any happier. Uh, our Most religions, many, many religions argue, traditional religions argue that uh, wealth is is either bad or certainly not good. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it says in the Talmud, who, who, is hap- who is rich, he was happy with his lot. And uh, that's a tough it's a tough sell. It's a tough sell in the modern world. We all understand that. We all have, I think, a basic fundamental biological drive to have more. But I think uh, that's um, – doesn't, as you point out in the book, doesn't necessarily make us happy. And I think the a challenge of being a, a mature and adult, whether it's a spiritual person or not, whether you're religious, the traditional sense or not, is to have some perspective about what real satisfaction – where it comes from. Yeah, well, I think that the, the ethical revolution of capitalism was that it reversed all these age-old uh, maxims and, and wisdom. It basically tells people it's good to want more, greed is good, wealth is good. Uh, the most ethical people in society are exactly the ones that uh, uh, increase economic productivity and in a very deep way, what capitalism says is that egoism is altruism. Uh, it's not bad to want more and to try to advance yourself. Um, I mean, it's it usually not, not uh, um, put in such stark terms, but I think this is the essence of the moral, moral revolution that capitalism brought about. And it should be said that compared to most other religions, Capitalism actually uh, lived up to many of its <laughs> promises. I mean, you have all these religions that promise you paradise in the afterlife, and you know who knows whether it's it's, it's true or not. Capitalism promises a sort of paradise here on earth, and uh, again, compared to most other religions, it it provides uh, a lot of its promises. Well, but as you point out. Uh... We don't get a lot happier as we get richer after a certain minimum point, probably. The part I think is true about that capitalist religion is that it's better to see your children survive childhood. It's better to see your children survive into adulthood because you're living longer. And there's no doubt a relationship between life expectancy and health and quality of life and and wealth. It's very hard to sustain long-lived healthy people uh, without, without, without wealth. And one of the appeals of growth is this idea that we'll be able to live even longer. Maybe that's a, maybe that's a mistake, but I certainly, uh, it's certainly the case that there, that it's a complicated story, right? Capitalism's got many good things about it and it's got many things that are corrosive and, and destructive to the soul. If you're not careful, you can be lured into doing some very, very unhealthy things if you're not careful. Um, yeah, I, I think um, that, that capitalism is, in, in this sense, maybe the most successful religion in history. It's the only religion in which everybody believes. Jews, Muslims, Christians, Hindus, everybody believes to some extent. The Buddhists, not they so believe. much. The Buddhists, not so much, as you point out, though. Uh, no, not, not the religion, but you have many Buddhist countries which in effect, adopt the uh, maxims, the practices of capitalism. And it's so it, at the same time, it's a force for immense good and a force for uh, terrible things that are happening around the world, as, for instance, the destruction of the ecological system. Uh, it's not a simple story. 
I don't think that, uh, I mean, you, ha- you hear sometimes very like simplified stories that capitalism is evil and all the terrible things in the world, they are all the fault of capitalism. And then you have the simplified story that capitalism is wonderful and all the good things in the world are the uh, uh, capitalism deserves the credit for them. And I think that like most, uh, uh, like most big revolutions in history, it has a bit of both. It has done some wonderful things like helping to um, overcome famine and plagues and even wars, which are on decline. Yeah. But at the same time, it was also responsible for terrible things, both at the collective level and at the individual level. And the first step is to acknowledge the uh, complexity of the situation, that a one-sided, either black or white, story of capitalism is not going to advance us very far, especially because today in the world, there is no viable alternative. It's very fashionable to blame capitalism for all kinds of of evil things and bad things, but the basic uh, reality is that today in 2015, nobody has a better idea about how to run the economy and how to run society. Yeah, well, I like to think of um, this quote. I, I don't know who where it comes from. I was told it's from Mad Magazine, but it's the quote is, "Under capitalism, man oppresses man, but under communism, it's the other way around." And I think, <laughs> I think that that joke gets at a deep insight related to your insights, which is a lot of times we blame the religion, whether it's a traditional religion or whether it's a modern ideology, or something bad that happens or we give a credit for something good that happens. But a lot of it is built into our nature. It's who we are. And um, I think we're sometimes confusing causation and correlation there. Let's close. We're out, we're out of time. Let's close by talking. I want you to have the last word on history. You say, so why study history? Unlike physics or economics, history is not a means for making accurate predictions. I would have left economics out of that, but I would have just said unlike physics, but fine. You say, we study history not to know the future, but to widen our horizons. Um, Talk about that and and we'll close. What happens is that we are born into a particular social structure, a a particular uh, political uh, situation, which was shaped by historical processes And these historical processes shape not only the society around us, but also our mind, our thoughts, our fears, our hopes. We think they are our own, but very often our deepest desires and fears and expectations are uh, are shaped by history, and we don't know it. And this limits uh, our ability um, to envision alternatives to envision alternative futures, to see the full horizon of possibilities that is facing us both as individuals and as collective, as the human collective. Um, And I think the main uh, benefit of studying history is that when you start understanding how these historical processes shape my thoughts and my fears and my hope, my hopes, you get a certain degree of freedom to start thinking of other thoughts, to start hoping other things, and also start fearing uh, uh, other things. Uh, To give just an example, being born uh, into a capitalist world, it's extremely difficult for us to think outside the capitalist box about alternative human societies, alternative economic arrangements. Similarly, being born into a a humanist world, again, it's very difficult for us to imagine a non-humanist or post-humanist future. Um, And this limits our horizon of of, uh, possibilities and also our ability to deal with change because uh, things keep changing and now they change at a much faster rate than ever before in history. And if we are stuck with the old ideas, it's very, very difficult to understand what's happening and to adjust to it. Um, If you look today at the world, 
I think it's fair to say that nobody has the slightest idea how the world would look like in 2050, except that it would be very, very different <laughs> from the world of today. If you take practical things like the job market, uh, many experts estimate that artificial intelligence will take maybe 50% of the jobs in the USA within 30 or 40 years. If you today go to college and, and you think, what should I study so that I will have some useful profession in 30, 40 years, nobody really knows what you should study. It could well be that in 30 years, we won't need most human doctors or lawyers because computers would be able to do it better than humans. And similarly, we don't really know what the family structure would be like, uh, what our bodies uh, would be like with the advent of uh, uh, genetic engineering and brain computer interfaces and nanotechnology and, and things like that. Nobody really knows how the human body would look like in 50 years. So I think the main thing that history can give us is a broader perspective on the present and the future. Some people think that we'll study the good decisions and bad decisions from the past and simply repeat the good decisions and avoid the bad decisions. <laughs> but it never works like that. Yeah. Uh, the situation is so different from anything that happened previously in history that you, I don't think you can, you can make any uh, uh, generalizations or you can make any practical decisions based on, on such a notion of history. My guest today has been Yuval Harari. Yuval, thanks for being part of EconTalk. Thank you. This is EconTalk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more EconTalk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for EconTalk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.